Do more, please. Okay, good morning, students. Good afternoon. Uh, let's begin lecture. We have a full lecture today. I dismissed the previous class right on at 11.50, so we'll probably be going until 1.20, uh, depending on how smart you guys are. And how many times the display flickers or doesn't flicker. Now, you're going to need your eye clicker today if you got it. Uh, you're not peeing. I didn't do anything. All I'm doing is talking. I didn't even touch my computer or the cable or anything. I'm really getting ticked off. Gosh. Okay, this time for sure. Uh, anyway, um, yeah, have your eye clicker ready. And don't forget, you have to register it uh, in web courses. And uh, I noticed uh, Elizabeth Hurt, are you here? Um, I talked to you last night. Yeah, we got you registered. And I noticed a bunch of you are registered, and that's good. And what we're going to do is, uh, as I mentioned last time, give one bonus point for every class that you are registered before January 31st, starting today. So if you have your eye clicker, you haven't registered it, see if you can get it registered. I won't get to the registration until about 2 o'clock. Uh, but after that, I'll be uploading one point for everybody that's registered by about 2 o'clock. Okay. Anyways, I want to reemphasize the exam schedule to start. Um, midterm exam 1 is February 7th. And exam 2, March 7th, so two sevens in a row. And just to reemphasize and engrave it in your mind, uh, exam three is April 11th. And that's on the other side of, I believe that's, yeah, that's on the other side of spring break. And of those three, we will drop the lowest of the three scores. If you miss one of them and you're there for two, the one that you miss is going to be a zero because you don't have a grade. That's going to be the one that's dropped. So what you want to do, as I've said before, is be there for all three of them. And then you have the luxury of having three grades. Hopefully they're not bad, but you can still choose the best two instead of being stuck with the only two. Now the final exam for you guys is on Thursday at 10 a.m. Uh, April 27th, right? If you desire, if you have an iOS device or a Mac OS computer, you can download the WebCal link. Uh, there's a page for it in our web courses area. Uh, raise your hand if you've already tried that. Anybody try that? Okay, a couple of you. Good. Um, I don't know if you can do it on an Android device, uh, you know, because I don't have a uh, Android phone. Uh, but you can probably download an app that will handle it. And it basically has the basic um, schedule, you know, exams and lectures and stuff like that, office hours. All right, so you can do that. And here's another look at the exam schedule. Uh, the most basic look. Three midterms, one final. Yes, question. Um, yeah, you're gonna have to just mess around with it. It's I think you have to like highlight calendar or something. It, but you have to cut and paste. Uh, you, you cut it from that web page. Ooh, that's going to be tricky on a phone, on an iPhone. Anyway, see what you can do. Okay. Um, and if we have a little time after class, maybe you come up. Do you have your computer with you? 
Maybe we could do it after class. Okay. Office hours. Uh, I had office hours and not a single student came. You, uh, well, actually, I had one student come to office hours. A student from, a, uh, I think, last spring semester came and, and we shot the, shot the breeze for about 30 minutes. About this and that, but nobody from this class. Nobody from the morning class. Uh, but I was there 9 to 11, and I'll be there Wednesdays 9 to 11 uh, in the Physical Sciences Building, room 158. Now, Miss Caroline... Uh, the other TA, one of the other two TAs, uh, is going to have office hours on Fridays, 1.30 to 2.30. And uh, so if you can't make it to mine, try to get to Caroline's. Because every, you know, they've done a lot of educational research over the years. And some of you that are ed majors, you may have heard this and read about it. The least efficient method of students, students learning new information is lecture and every minute out almost anything you do with the instructor outside the lecture hall outside conventional lecture is more efficient so in other words office hours and so that applies to Caroline as well and SI uh, so every minute that you can spend in office hours is going to help you if you can make it now if you can't Gosh, this thing is burning my grits. These displays. I don't know, man. Did you see that video of that little kid with the doll and the table moved? Did you see that on the internets? It was supposed to be like a like a, 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 a possessed doll or something like that. And it may, I think it's in charge of the computer display here. See, as soon as I talk about it. This is bad. What? No, it's not my, you know what it is? It's got to be somewhere downhill from my laptop. Why did we stop using the HDMI cable? Because uh, it messed up the sound, but I'm going to have to start going back to that if I could get a nice short one. Uh, this is driving me. Well, let's keep going. I'll narrate, and let me just say one thing, Darian Fry over here to my right, uh, she hasn't decided on lecture on office hours yet, but when she does, this is sick, this is driving me nuts. I'm trying to think of where I could hit. Hold on. Yeah, percussive. talking to the equipment now. That's bad. It's a bad sign. I have to tell the guys that maintain this. Something's flaking out. Anyways, Darian is thinking about having off -star. She hasn't decided yet. Hopefully she will. If she doesn't, she doesn't. But as I always say, get to off -stars. Get to SI. If you can, every minute there is going to help you learn. It, and it's going to help you think. And thinking is what you've got to do in order to persevere and to prevail. All right, physical sciences building, how do you get there? There's a picture of it from the parking lot. It's a couple years old. Counseling centers over here, if you know where that is, right next to Sumter Hall. Um, shuttle bus stop right about here. 
over here behind uh, PSB and kind of off to the to to the right of it is Harris Engineering and directly. I mean, if you could see through X-ray vision right through the physical sciences building, you'd see the biology building. So, uh, and then this parking lot is the one right next to Sumter Hall. So, the one that's completely there's like spaces for about three faculty and everything else is have you ever noticed the parking spots the ones that are reserved for 24 hours you know how much they cost a thousand dollars a year to have one of those and this parking lot it's either students or reserved parking it drives me crazy all right, supplemental instruction schedule. We don't have it yet, but as soon as we do, I'll have it every day in the very first slide where we have the little outline of the day's lesson. Uh, and usually it's the second week of classes before we get that. So uh, Maria will be having SI hopefully by next Tuesday. All right, and I'll probably put it in web courses as well, a discussion area and whatnot. Let's talk about the e-textbook uh, interactions uh, of, of which I'm the author. Here's the cover photograph, uh, a football game out in California in the rain. One of, yeah, one of my, one of my, that's right, one of my favorite photographs. Um, to get the book. You can, um, if you have to, you can use the UCF bookstore. Did anybody buy it over there since Tuesday? So what do you do? You buy a little card or something? All right. Are, so are they out of cards yet? Did they? I can't believe that they could run out of cards because all I have to do is FedEx overnight a bunch of new cards. It should be easy, but the bookstore... Nothing's easy over there, I guess. Anyway, KendallHunt.com, they've got it. Uh, this website address, that's going to be your better one, a little cheaper. Um, and then you download the Bookshelf app from Vitalsource.com. And, and actually, you can, once you've purchased the book, I was just working with a student after class from the morning section, and she actually had the book open in Safari. And I said to Darian, boy, I didn't know that you could look at the book in Safari, but apparently you can. And then over in one of the side menus on the left side of the screen um, was the little button that lets you download the app. Uh, and that's a standalone app. It's a little bit better. And I want to actually talk about it. Because in the app, you can, you can read and study, of course, but you can also use highlights. And I want to talk about the highlights. Okay, here's the... Kendall Hunt webpage, if you buy it there, 85 bucks, it's a fairly good price. And students, I, all, I, I donate my royalties to a scholarship fund. So I, mean, I haven't even been paid any royalties yet. I've been, so, I've been using this book for two years. I don't know why, but I wish it was cheaper. And, when, you know, if I publish it next year, third edition, I might just publish it myself and sell it for five bucks you know like a pdf for five bucks that wouldn't be too bad so i wish it was cheaper for you guys it's kind of ridiculous anyway uh so when you open the app this is the library page or the library window okay now if you have other books from kendall hunt they'll be in this window and i've got two i've got the first edition over here and the second edition, that's ours, right here, highlighted. Once you click on that, it'll pop out a new window, and you'll see the actual text. And here it is in the introduction, a picture of Galileo and a little bit of text. And actually, that's some text that we're going to talk about today, about uh, the grand book that he calls the universe. And another feature of the app that I want to emphasize to you is highlights and these are good uh, strategic uh, study tools because um, you can actually um, click on a highlight like this one and um, 
you know, you can make your own highlights, but the really good thing is you could subscribe to my highlights using it, my email address. And when you look at my highlights, it's like you're looking into my textbook and seeing all the things that I underline and highlight and all the text that I've written in. And you can see that I've written in stuff over there in those highlights. And if you subscribe to mine in the app, you can read all those. Now, why would that be valuable? Well, it would only be valuable if you feel like getting an A and crushing an exam or two. Because if I write something in highlights, um, it, there's a high probability I think it's important, and therefore it's probably going to show up possibly on the exam. I can't write everything on the, on the exam that I like, that I think is important, but a good fraction of them, yes. So it's, it'll help you savvy the things that I think are important, and then that in turn will help you to prepare for the exam in which I try to savvy your mind and see if you really understand the things that are important and can distinguish between them. So you can subscribe to the highlights. Here's what my uh, account center looks like. Uh, and that's the email address. Now let me make it a little bit bigger for you. Uh, go ahead and write that down. It's deliberately misspelled, Brew Beckner. Uh, at knights.ucf.edu. It's a phony email address. I don't really use it for anything except for like subscribing to software and stuff. That you know where they they use the an email address for your uh, for your username and stuff. And so, but you can use it. That's the one. If you type that in, you know you go. I think you go into the library window, and then you look for a little symbol, a little picture of a, a human, you know, like a human head, and you click that, and it'll ask you for friends. And then who do you want to subscribe to and stuff like that. And then you type in this email address and you'll be able to look at my highlights. Okay. Uh, so don't use it to send email to me because I don't ever look at it. Uh, but do use it to subscribe to the highlights and then study with the highlights. Question. What's that? The app is called Bookshelf. And it's from vitalsource.com. And when you purchase the, have you purchased the book yet? When you purchase the book, it'll prompt you to download. If you go to kendalltohunt.com, it'll prompt you to download the app. And I don't know, uh, for you guys that bought the card, did it prompt you to download? No? So, but anyways, it's called Bookshelf. It's on the syllabus, bookshelf from vitalsource.com. Right. It works good. It's free. And if you have the book, it, that's how you look at the book. All right. Now, let's do a practice question on iClicker. Darian, are you ready? All right. Now, does this have Go Nitro? Uh, go yeah. Nights? Go Night. Okay. Now, go ahead and turn on your clicker. And what I want you to do is hold the power button down until the until the square in the upper left is flashing. And then type in BB. That's your frequency code. Bravo, bravo. All right? If you have your clicker. All right? And then you'll get a check mark. And then it'll say, go night. And then it'll say, ready. Okay? Who got a go night? Okay, great. So that means you guys are talking to my, um, my base unit up here. This is, a, this, is a little, this is like a little teeny cell phone, real basic cell phone, limited range. Uh, it's, but anyways, it's radio frequency, so you don't have to like aim it, you know, like your, your television clicker at home, you got to aim it, stuff. Uh, you can do behind the back and stuff with this thing uh, out in the parking lot. But anyways, it's talking to this. So I've got, I guess, 67 of you. Uh, on the frequency. All right, so that means, but it doesn't mean you're registered. Okay, what means you're registered is if you register through uh, webcourses.com, the little navigation panel in the upper left. Okay, that's where you register. If you're not registered there, you can click as long as you want in class. I won't know it's you, and you won't get any dineros. You won't get any bonus points. 
But for all of these that you guys that are registered, I know who you are. I register. I, I synced last night. Finally got it to sync. And uh, you'll be getting a bonus point today, as I mentioned before class. All right, so let's do a, a clicker question here. It's, I want you to think very carefully. Highly scientific concept. Here it is. There. You ready? I know it's on. Which individual is the toughest? Thirty seconds to vote. Twenty seconds. Ten, nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one, zero. Oh, uh, switch to computer. All right, who's the genius that voted for uh, Barney? <laughs> Gosh. All right, switch back to... We had some people last hour that voted for Justin Bieber. What is that? Gosh. Anyways, this is just a practice question. But go back to, go back to computer just for a second. And see, most of you guys voted for Chuck Norris. Wrong answer. Go ahead to laptop. Here's the right answer. Bruce Lee. Most of you, many of you didn't know that. Yeah, Bruce Lee is the actual, the only guy that ever beat up Chuck Norris, and it was in a movie. The Way of the Dragon, 1972. So little known tough guy fact. Uh, about Chuck Norris. Anyways, this is a practice question, just so you can, you know, try see how the clicker works and everything. And question. What? I can't hear what you're saying. In the. What's defaulting? For the clicker. Um, did you get the little black and white box below that restates your serial number? On the, on, on the internet, on your browser. Yeah, that's good. You're good. You're good. Don't worry. Everything's good. We'll check, but come after class and we'll check it. Yeah, we can check it pretty easy. Uh, yeah, anyways. So we're going to continue doing practice questions until January 31st. So the, the 25 points for your semester grade start on January 31st. Until that time, we'll do a couple, three practice questions. And most of them are going to be physics and stuff. But this first one is usually a Chuck Norris question. I might throw in another Chuck Norris question or two, see if you guys are really smart. But I want to go back now and talk about this learning thing, this thing that we do, um, the quest for truth, or as I like to say, the quest for that which is true. And uh, we're going to talk about that. It is the thing that we're doing. The entire scientific enterprise is part of this thing that we do, this quest for truth. So let's talk about uh, that. You know, there's a lot of questions that you can ask about that which is true. In other words, to, for instance, does it reside in the thing, the object, or does it reside in your intellect? So now, to, you know, part of the answer of this is I got three different philosophers, famous ones, uh, Aristotle from the ancient Greeks. Uh, his definition of truth was this. Now, this is pretty elaborate. I'm going to try to read it with expression so that you can catch it. It's, it's tough. It's tough. 
To say of what is that it is not, or of what is not that it is, is false. So that's his definition of false. A statement that says of what is that it is not, or a statement about what is not that it is. That's false. While to say of what is that it is, and of what is not that it is not, is true. All right, now that's from his metaphysics. St. Augustine, another philosopher from the days of the ancient Romans, um, said, that is true, which is very simple. Right? And, of course, he was writing, you know, he had paragraphs and pages and books uh, more about it, but that was the definition that he went with. Aquinas, uh, from the Middle Ages. Uh, truth, that towards which the intellect tends. And that's the definition I think is best for us because it is phrased in terms of the quest. That towards which the human intellect naturally tends. That is the thing that we do. And you can read a lot more about those guys and other philosophers, but let's keep going. Um, and let's ask, you know, as I said before, what are the signs of the truth? How do you recognize it? What are the criteria of that which is true? Well, the scientific enterprise that is going to be the topic of our entire semester. How to figure out and negotiate our way through this universe that we're continually looking at in a way that allows us to make statements that are true in a scientific manner. Now, that's not the only thing that is true in this world. Another thing that's true, hopefully, is a love letter. Or a love song. Words of love. But you want them to be true. Now here's a famous uh, folk song, Barbara Allen, the last, uh, last verses of it. And there they twined in a true love's knot The red, red rose and the briar. True love. True love. In that song, and... The Lord knows there's many other songs, many other love songs, love letters, love poems, love words, love. We, all, we don't want it to be false. We want it to be true. Everybody wants that. Court of law, we talked about that last time. Uh, court of law, for instance, in the federal, let's, let's look at this in detail. Federal courts, you know, so the FBI, they, they, they capture a... You know, or the Secret Service captures a counterfeiter, or the FBI captures, uh, let's see, a hijacker or something like that, or, or a mafiosa, uh, and they bring it to federal court. The federal courts, Rule 804, Federal Rules of Evidence, is about hearsay. As a matter of fact, it's the exceptions to hearsay, because in general, hearsay evidence is not admissible. You've heard that. You know, you watch CSI, you watch crime. What is that other stuff? Law and order, you know, and, and uh, the prosecutors, well, that's inadmissible. No, that's, in, you know, oh, it's admissible. And, you know, they have all these arguments about what's admissible or not. Hearsay, no way. Except for, for instance, in Rule 804, in the Federal Rules of Evidence, a statement under belief of imminent, imminent death. That is admissible. And that's what you call a deathbed confession. And think about what the assumption is behind that. The assumption is that if you are on your deathbed, you're not going to lie. You have no motive to lie. If you say something, it's going to be true. And in a court of law, it is admissible. Right? Similarly, Statement against interest. Um, now, this is where you say something that you would never say unless it's absolutely true because it tends to put you in jail. Or it tends to um, take away your property or your, your money. 
proprietary. That means your property. It, the statement that you have made or that somebody makes is so contrary to the proprietary, the property interest, or pecuniary, the money interest, financial interest, or has a great tendency to expose the declarant, the person making the statement, to civil or cr criminal liability that nobody would ever make it a statement like that if it was true. In other words, it's like saying, yeah, I, I kidnapped uh, John... John Q. Public. You would never say that unless it was... No, nobody would lie about that. You know, unless it was... You know, so that, that is admissible. A, a statement against interest. All right? And there's, there's reasons that people make statements against interest. And so th these are some of the criteria in a federal courtroom. You know, you know, some things are admissible as true statements if, the, for instance, they're a deathbed confession or if it's a statement against interest. It can be used. And there's all kinds of, and there's rules that you can't admit. You know, there's some things you can't admit. And there's some things that you can admit as evidence. So those are criterion of truth in a court of law. Now let's look at the scientific enterprise. And here's a picture of Galileo uh, peering through his telescope. Now, they didn't have photographs in his day, so that's like an artist's conception of Galileo making observations. And he's the first guy that used a telescope to look at the stars, to look at the planets and the moon. He even used it to look at the sun. He discovered sunspots. He didn't invent the telescope, but he used it as an astronomical observation device and became very famous about that. In fact, we're going to be talking about some of the things that he wrote about comets and his observations of comets. The whole thing that they were trying to do in, in, for, for Galileo is he was trying to predict the future state of some physical system. So the scientist observes his world and tries to answer questions about the things that he sees. Just like I talk about in the introduction to the textbook. The discussion of that photograph, those football players. All the people observing him, whether it's the referees, the coaches, the other team, or the fans in the stands, they're all learning, they're observing in order to extract information, specifically who's going to win the game. That's why you go. You want it because it's exciting, right? It's fun. And... Every play, you watch every play, because every play gets your team either closer or further away from victory. All right? And that's a judgment. That's the expectation you have when you're observing um, a football game. Same thing if you're observing the universe. You're trying to see if a pattern emerges or some kind of a plan. Now, the football players are always doing that. Baseball players, too. You know, what is, their, what is their defense? You know, the quarterback, you know, in the NFL or in college, you know, they go up to the line of scrimmage and they, they check out the linebackers. You know, how the linebackers stacked up. What are the DBs doing? What's the safety doing? Is the safety edging over to the right or to the left? Is it going to be a zone defense or man-to-man? -man? You know, is it cover two or is it, you know, or, or some variation? You know, because then... They change the play, and they, you know, hopefully get a touchdown, all right? So they're always trying to look for a pattern of some kind. Another thing, what are the interactions happening? You know, this is something a coach up in the stands is going to do. He's going to say, man, how are my DBs handling the wide receivers? Can my linebackers tackle that tailback? You know, can my offensive line move the defensive line out of the way and get me a first down or a touchdown? You know, those are interactions. Scientist is the same way. Only the things that we're thinking about are planets, stars, the comets, the sun, baseballs, cannonballs, you know, anything that's in motion. We want to be able to predict where it's going to go. And one of the things that you do is um, look at the patterns and the interactions in that physical system. Because what you want to do is figure out the future state. You know, you're looking at this big universe, 
and you want to figure out what's going to happen. I want to know what my future holds. You know, isn't that what everybody wants to know as much as you can? I want to know what's for dinner. I want to know the next time I'm going to have pizza. You know, I want to know if the Cheatriots are going to be defeated. That's what I always think about. They keep winning. I hate the Cheatriots. New England Patriots, I don't even know. Don't get me started. Anyways. So the future state. So if, if you start your time down here at point A at time t equals 0, 0.00 seconds, um, by the time your baseball gets up here to this upper point, you know, how much time is it going to take? All right? And you do that, you know, if you're playing baseball or basketball and somebody throws you the ball or somebody hits the ball, or you're you're under the, you're blocking out underneath the hoop and you're trying to get a rebound you have to time your leap you have to get to the right spot to catch that fly ball you've got to be able to run fast enough to get to second base before the catcher gets the ball to second base and the second baseman tags you out you don't want that all right you want to be able to time this stuff all right and the same with galileo and then the fourth thing that you're, you're wondering about is, how do I tell that to my peer? You know, for Galileo, he had peers all over Europe, scientific guys, scientific-minded guys that he corresponded with. You know, he didn't have email. He didn't have Twitter. He didn't have anything like that. He had these things that we call letters where they write on paper and they, they send them through the mail and stuff, and it, you know with stamps and stuff like that. Uh, and, you know, he was, but he was famous all over Europe. They exchanged letters, long letters. You know, you can read about him. And he, he wrote to famous kings and queens and princes and princesses and stuff like that, dukes, and all that kind of stuff. Um, so the, the idea is that you want to communicate it in a way that somebody else can comprehend and maybe so that they can replicate and go out and observe the same thing and say, yeah, I verify that. Yep, Galileo, you got it. Your, your observation of comets, yeah, that, that's what I saw too. Your theory about cometary motion, yep, it's on the money. I verified it. Now here's the formula. Look at this. Y subscript F equals Y subscript I plus V subscript IY times T plus one-half gt squared. We're going to know that thing backwards and forwards in a few weeks. That's one of the equations that Galileo developed for the y-coordinate of a baseball or anything else in free fall. Now, Tuesday, we're going to start putting that thing together, and we're going to work with it over the next couple weeks. And it looks pretty fancy now, but it's going to be fairly cinchy for you. By the end of the semester... This equation, you're going to feel, oh, yeah, dude, I got it, you know, ding. So let's get down to business. This is our boss, the founder of our school, the headmaster, Professor Galileo. Did you know that he was a math professor? There was no such thing as physics in his day. He was a, math, he's a mathematics professor, but he invented the entire... Uh, field of physical science. And his criterion of truth, scientific truth, about the physical world is what we are doing in this class. And we're going to be talking about it the entire time. And let's read a statement that he made in 1623. This is the crucial statement of Galileo. I mean, if you think about a landslide, you know, you, you, you're you up on a mountain and you throw one little pebble down the mountainside and it starts a cascade of other pebbles and rocks and then boulders and then a whole landslide. This is the pebble. He was writing in this book, Il Saggiatore, 
the assayer. It was about comets, 1623. There was a controversy about comets. You know, what are they? Where are they going? Why do they do what they do? Why do we see them the way we see them? And so it, in, the, in, the, in the process of, of writing, and, and, and actually this is a book arguing with another scientist, another mathematician, that he thought was wrong, he said this, philosophy, which is his word for science, physics, um, philosophy is written in this grand book, I mean the universe, which stands continually open to our gaze, but it cannot be understood unless one first learns to comprehend the language and interpret the characters in which it is written. Right? So he's the observer, and he's trying to comprehend it. It has a meaning. He's convinced that the universe has a meaning and that he can comprehend it. And that the language that communicates that meaning to him is going to be mathematical. Here's the next part of that statement, very famous statement. It is written, this language, in the language of mathematics and its characters are triangles, circles, and other geometrical figures without which it is humanly impossible to understand a single word of this book. I mean the universe. Without these, one is wandering about in a dark labyrinth. So his conviction was, after thinking it over and observing, he said, and he has been proven correct, that the truth about the physical world is going to be mathematical. You just looked at one of his equations. Y subscript F equals Y subscript I plus all that other stuff. That was his conviction, and he has been proven correct. And there's his famous equation. Now, let's get down to the very basic, the very most basic concept in understanding the universe, and that's motion. Now, there's a famous... A scientist in the 1800s called uh, James Clark Maxwell. He was the English scientist that figured out the electromagnetic field that we use for cell phones and computers and everything else. He figured out electromagnetic radiation and all kinds of stuff. Very smart guy. And his textbook about physics was simply called Matter and Motion. And that's the title of his book. And so we're going to talk about motion, the motion of matter. All right. What's that? Is that the glass guy? The glass guy? No, I don't know who you're thinking of. Now, he lived a long life. There, there have been scientists that have died young, but I can't think of who with glass. Maybe a different... Well, maybe, maybe I'll... I'll have to look that up. Maybe he did, did die younger than he should have. I, I'll look it up. All right. The very most basic concept of motion is velocity. Where are you going and how fast are you getting there? Speed, how fast are you getting there? How many miles per hour? If you're really booking, you're going 60 miles an hour. If you're poking along, you're going 25 miles an hour. Okay, so that's the speed. But where you're going is just important. Are you heading for Miami or are you heading for uh, Jacksonville? Big difference. Especially if you have tickets for the heat game. You know, you don't want to head for Jacksonville if you've got tickets. Okay, so these things encode the motion. And this is going back to what we've, we were saying about predicting the future state of an object. The velocity encodes the motion of an object so well that you can predict its future state. Okay? You can predict the, f the position at a future time. Oops. Position at a future time. Velocity at a future time. All right? But that's if you know how the velocity evolves over time. Okay, so for instance, the velocity, you might get faster or slower 
Or you might change direction, right? So if you're driving down to Miami on the turnpike, you know, you got to pay attention to your speedometer. And if you got to get down there by a certain time, you know, by game time, and you don't want to be late for the game, you want to catch the full, you know, four quarters of the game, you got to be there by a certain time. So you got to have this, a certain amount of speed, okay? And if it's not fast enough, you got to speed up. Similarly, you got to be in, go in the right direction. You don't want to, uh, you don't want to be at the Turkey Lake Service Plaza because that isn't that's that's north. That's the other side of Orlando, right? The Turkey Turkey Neck Service Plaza. And you want to go towards Miami. That's the other direction, right? So if you go to Turkey Neck uh, Service Plaza, you're going to be S O L. Now the way that you that we encode the evolution over time of the velocity is something called the equations of motion. Equation or equations plural. Equations of motion. Or another way to say it, you know, depending on the context, uh, the time evolution equations of a certain system. And I'll invite you to uh, raise your hand if you have gone to the movies to see uh, that that new movie that just came out last week, um, Hidden Figures. Anybody seen that yet? I'm one. You guys are not inspiring. <laughs> not yet. I'm going to go see that because it it's a. Did you like it? Yeah. Seriously? That's pretty good. Yeah, Hidden Figures. It's about a team of women mathematicians that worked for NASA back in the 60s, and they were trying to back up the computer. Back in the early 60s, a computer that could do... A computer that could do what this little piece of junk does would fill a room. A computer, who's got a calculator? Raise your calculator if you've got one. Who's, who's got a calculator? There it is. Calculator over there. All right. A computer that could do that, what that calculator does would fill a room in the early 60s. The space program, they, it, it's, it's incredible what they did. And so they had to employ half the PhDs on the planet to crank out the numbers so that their spacecraft, you know, would arrive where they wanted it to at the time they wanted it to. You know, so, so John Glenn makes the first orbit of the Earth, and they want him to land uh, in the Atlantic Ocean off the coast of uh, Cape Canaveral, not too far out in the ocean, during the day, not during the night, and not too far out. They don't want him landing in Kansas. They don't want them landing in Russia. You know, they don't want them landing in the middle of the Pacific. They want them, land, you know, in a, and that's how they do it. And so all, so that movie is all about that. And the team of women that they um, had, uh, apparently it's an inspiring story. So I'm going to go see it hopefully this weekend, take my wife to it. But those guys, in that movie, they were working with equations of motion. The time evolution equations of a spacecraft. Oh boy, you're talking. The, the, we're going to be doing equations of motion. We just looked at one. That equation of motion for free fall, the y coordinate in free fall of a baseball or any other object in free fall. Uh, but the spacecraft, much more complicated system. Uh, but you can do it. It's a complicated system and. Uh, and that's what that movie's about. So I'm going to go look at that. And we're going to be tackling the same stuff. And as I've said before, you may think, well, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm no good in science. That's BS. Now that you're... Barnyard stuff. Now that you're in this class, you're part of the scientific enterprise. You thought you were safe. So let's look at motion in two dimensions. Basic, basic, basic. Let's study this, this uh, basic task. 
study motion uh, of an object between point A and point B. What do you start with? You got two points in space. The first thing you got to do is figure out how far they are apart. Now, what you got to do is lay down a coordinate system. Now, between the previous slide, now look at this slide. There's no graph paper. All right, you looking at it? Look at it. Don't look at your Facebook. Look at it. See, there's no good. There's no graph paper lines. Now I got graph paper lines, but I still don't have coordinate axes. So now I'm going to put in coordinate axes, y axis and x axis. We're working in two dimensions. Those guys in that movie, they're working in three dimensions. That's what makes it tough. Boy, oh boy. All right, so my y axis, the origin of coordinates is down there in the lower left where that red square is. And then the x axis comes off to the right. All right, at the bottom of the screen. All right, and once I've done that, I have a y coordinate and an x coordinate uh, that I can attach to both uh, items. But I better know how big my graph paper squares are, my coordinate system. In other words, is it in meters? Is it in miles? Is it in nanometers? A nanometer is a billionth, B billionth of a meter, a millionth of a millimeter, a thousandth of a thousandth of a millimeter. So think of a millimeter and div divide it into a thousand equal pieces and then another, each one of those a thousand equal pieces and that's a nanometer. Now a nanometer is appropriate for something the size of an atom or a molecule. All right. So you might say you know an atom is maybe 2.7 nanometers across or a molecules 32.9 nanometers from end to end or something like that. But humans, we would be measured in meters or centimeters. Centimeters are good too. But now a city or a county, any kind of a civic uh, division, uh, miles, you know. And uh, astronomical distances, uh, light years. Did you, you know how many light seconds it is from the, the surface of the sun to earth? 500 light seconds. So the distances in the solar system, uh, you wouldn't use nanometers, miles, or meters. Although you could. You would use light seconds, light minutes, light hours, light days. You wouldn't use light years, though. But light days, yeah. Anyways, let's, let's work in meters for this. And if we're working in meters, um, the coordinates uh, for point B and, and, and point A are the following. For point A, 8 comma 16. That means 8 blocks of 1 meter graph paper to the right of the origin, 16 blocks above the origin, 8 comma 16. Similarly, point B, 44 blocks all the way over to the right. And 24 blocks up, one meter per block on this graph paper. All right? And then to figure out the distance between them, well, first you've got to draw a dotted line or a line segment. It's a dotted line segment. And then, you know, to figure out this distance, now we're working in two dimensions, not three. So in two dimensions, uh, on graph paper, in other words, uh, you want to think about this right triangle. Now, I'm going to back my triangle off a little bit for comparison. So there it is. Okay. The distance between point A and point B is the length of that hypotenuse. All right. Now, if you think about it, the width of that right triangle, it's between 44 meters and 8 meters. So that means it's 36 meters across. And the levels are 24 meters high and 16 meters for the low. So that's 8 meters. So there's the dimensions of your right triangle. So go ahead and pencil that in on your sketch. And if you want to, you can read more about right triangles and symmetry and stuff in the appendix, triangles and other shapes. You know, for a little workout, a little extra workout, if you're a little rusty with Pythagorean theorem and stuff. Because we're going to use Pythagorean theorem here in a second. And by the way, keep, make sure uh, we're going to do a, 
a distance calculation on eye clicker in just a minute too. So keep your eye clicker hand. All right. So here's my uh, triangle. Here's the you know the the, the uh, Pythagorean theorem is a squared plus b squared equals c squared. Okay. C is the hypotenuse. All right. A and B are the two perpendicular sides, whatever they happen to be. Okay, one of my perpendicular sides here is 36. One of them's uh, 8. So I have 36 squared plus 8 squared equals hypotenuse squared. Now that means that the length of the hypotenuse, D, is the square root of all that. Now, this shows you why your calculator needs to have a square root key. So you can't use a second, third, fourth, fifth grade calculator, you know, like a little, little really cheap ones, but it's got to be something with a square root key on it. So a scientific calculator is fine. Graphing calculator is fine. You may not use a cell phone on, on the exam, but you can use a cell phone calculator in class, of course, in lecture. So 36 squared, that's the square of the base, and 8 squared, that's the square of the height. And then you add those up. Let's see, 36 is like a thousand and something. What's, what's 36 to the second power? Calculators, get your calculators out, come on. Don't be, what is it? 1,296, anybody verify that? Yeah, okay. 1,296. Okay, and 8 squared, that's cinchy, that's 64. That one I know. Okay, so 1296 plus 64. 1296 plus 4 is 1300. Okay, 1360, yeah, okay. So, but now we square root that, all right? And so we're down to 36.9. So that's the length of that hypotenuse, and physically would say that's the distance between these two points. Now, let me pause for questions. Okay, let's keep going. Let's try a distance calculation. And again, uh, actually, it's not going to say go nitro. It's going to say go night. Uh, so if you if you if you didn't do the first one, hold the power button down until you get the big square that flashes, and then type in BB, and you get a check mark, and then it'll say go night, and then it'll say ready. All right. Now this is a, a legitimate question, so we're not screwing around with this. It's not a Chuck Norris question. Uh, you ready? Here we go. Calculate the distances, or the distance between point Q and point C. All right, so here's 62, here's 92, here's point Q, here's point C. Go ahead and calculate that distance. And actually, you should be able to figure out the answer, even if you don't have a calculator, just do a little bit of superior strategy. You know, um, remember last spring when we were doing transcripts? We had everything captioned. The, the transcriptionist would sometimes email me, uh, Dr. B, do you want me to include everything? when you're having a conversation with Darian. You know, so we were talking about, you know, um, you know, Shrek or, uh, you know, Ham Alexander Hamilton or something like that. And I said, no, you don't have to do that. <laughs> but this thing catches everything. 
You know, I'm surprised that giving this thing a wrap is what caused it to stop flickering. I'm going to have to... Why are you laughing? It's, it's, it shouldn't happen that way. <laughs> this is like a brand new lectern up here. It shouldn't be... Maybe if it was 20 years old or something, yes, but... You know, like the physics in that old lecture hall over there? Oh, my God. Hey, has anybody in here had a, uh, a class in the mathematical science, MSB, the big subterranean lecture hall? In the, that place, although they renovated it, it's still it's pathetic. That's where we used to have all our classes over there. It was bad. Okay, 30 seconds. 30 seconds to vote. Fifteen seconds. Ten, nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. Bing. Okay, and Darian, she doesn't hesitate. She always. Wow, you guys are geniuses. Uh, go ahead and show them the. Ding. That's correct. Okay, switch back. You guys are, I don't know, maybe we can dismiss early today. 111 is the correct answer. Okay, for those of you that didn't, and, and actually for those of you that got it right, maybe you should jot this down. There's your calculation. Distance, square root of 62 squared plus 92 squared. And you know what? I Every time that we do a calculation in class, and this one's kind of cinchy for most of you, I guess, but we're going to be doing trickier ones, and I'm going to go step by step through it with you. Make sure everybody's got a decent handle handle on it, and just like I'm doing right now. So the next step is, uh, what's the square of 62? Well, it's 30, 38, 44. And what's the square of 92? 84, 64. And so those are inside the square root. Still, we haven't hit the square root key yet. Now we have to add them up, and what do you get? 1230, excuse me, 12308, 12,308. And now you hit the square root key, all right? And you get 111 approximately, all right? And just so you know, I figured it out on Google Maps. This is the distance between Cadoba and Chick-fil-A, point Q or point C. So... When I made this slide, I was thinking about lunch. <laughs> and anyway, now I want to go through with you, and this is good notes for everybody, whether you got it right or not. Because on the midterms and homework too, you'll have multiple choice questions that you might get stumped on. And you know that on a multiple choice question, it's good if you can reject one or two options, and then maybe make an educated guess on what remains. So let's analyze this in terms of rejecting something that's clearly wrong. Okay? Now, first of all, option A, 154. That is too big. And why is it too big? Well, it's too big because it's the sum of the two perpendicular sides, 92 and 62. They add up to 154. That's not the, the length of the, the hypotenuse. Hypotenuse is going to be shorter than that. Definitely shorter than that. All right? Now, option B is similarly, okay, so X out, option A. And remember, you want to be able to do this on an exam, on a, a, a really tough question. And if you can eliminate one or two and then nail down the correct answer, you know, you're going to be looking good. Now, option B, no good ski. It's too small. That's the difference between the two perpendicular sides. That's no good. I mean, because, you know, it's, it's going to be too small. Now, so X that one out. Now, so what that means is, 
the hypotenuse, it's got to be smaller than 154. And actually, it's got to be bigger than 62. That's the smallest of the two sides. Okay? It's going to be bigger than 92. It's going to, you know, obviously, it's going to be bigger than 62, but it's going to be less than 154. So somewhere between 62 and 154 is where you're going to find the answer. All right, so if you can get to this point, ding, you've got option E in the bag. Now look at option C and D. All right? Option C and option... What's wrong with them? It's, they're the squares. Those are the squares of the two opposite sides. Now, I want you to make a note about this. So circle those two and indicate squares of the two perpendicular sides. And then put a star next to that circle. And say, this is Dr. B trying to shake me. And let me explain why I say that. If you think about it, you know, you guys might not write a lot of tests, but I do. And when you write a multiple choice question, if you think about it, you've got to have the right answer in there. Right? Otherwise, it's a trick question. Right? Say, and I hate trick questions. So you've got to have the right answer in there. And then, so like you, like the first question we had, we had Godzilla, we had Chuck Norris, we had Bruce Lee, and we had uh, Barney the Purple Dinosaur and Justin Bieber. And nobody voted for Justin Bieber. It's obviously wrong. So you can't have that on a multiple choice question. Or you can't have all the options Justin Bieber type answers. Okay, Maybe one just for screwing around. But you've got, so you've got to have a good one. And then you can't have any Justin Bieber answers. But you've got to have something in there that's tempting. And how did I tempt you? Chuck Norris. The people that actually know the scoop knew that Bruce Lee was the toughest. And everybody knows that Godzilla doesn't really exist. So okay, that can't be the answer. I don't think Godzilla exists. Pretty sure Godzilla. I hope Godzilla doesn't exist. He's always tearing up Tokyo. Anyways. So, so you have to have the correct answer. And then you have to have at least one or two that are tempting. So write that in your notes. Dr. B trying to shake you with tempting answers. And some of it can be really tempting. You know, it could be like the correct answer, but for a, a different question. All right? So you have to read carefully, and you have to be able to say, no, Dr. B, no, I'm not going to get shaken. You're not going to throw me off. I'm going to lock down the correct answer, 111, and I'm on my way. That's what you want to be able to do. So in a multiple choice question, always remember that, that there's going to be a correct answer. There's going to be at least one or two tempting answers. And you've got to be able to think, even if you don't know how to answer it by calculation, if you can think about what you've got, you have a good shot at getting the correct answer. All right? Now, that's how we analyze this particular question. So we analyze, we get rid of... Uh, Option C and option D, and of course, option E is the only one that's good. All right? So remember that on uh, multiple choice questions in the future, whether it's on homework or exams. And use that as a strategy because I'm never going to give you a question in which it's impossible to, to differentiate between the... the, the True question, the true answer, and one of the tempting answers. So I'm never going to give you a, a question for which the answers are like 111 and 110.9. I'm never going to do that. All right? I'm going to give you 111 and something that's clearly different, but still tempting, but definitely not close to 111. All right? So remember that. Now, other instructors on this campus. I'm not going to name names, but they may try to do 
you know, questions like that where they give you the right answer and then something, you know, really close and see if they can burn your, you know what, but I'm not going to do that. I don't, I don't like that. I want you to think. Thinking is what you've got to do. Now, let's keep thinking about this task. All right, we've got eight minutes left. Look at what we got. That's the distance that, are, that's the path that a crow flies. But what if you're on a different path? What if you're on a curved path? You might have that. You know, what if it's a windy day and the wind's blowing north for a while so the crow flies a little north of the straight line and then the wind, another gust of wind from the, from the north blows him south and he's a little bit below the, you know, so you, you might have a curved path. You might have a segmented path like this. You know, you've got to be able to hack both of those things. Another thing that we don't have besides knowing the exact layout, the exact path, if you just have points A and B, the other thing you don't have is the time. What if you, um, what if you don't have the time of passage? So, for instance, what if you don't have time that it passes point A? So go ahead and write this down in your sketch. Time T subscript A. The time on the clock, fast approaching, 122 and 8 seconds in the PM. And let's say that time T subscript B is just a little bit after that, 122, 47, 122 PM and 47 seconds. Let's just say that you've got, if you don't have that, you can't really figure out a velocity. You don't have a hope of a velocity. And on top of that, what if the speed varies? I mean, if you're on a straight line path, you might still have a variation of speed, just like the tortoise and the hare. You know, the hare, the tortoise had a constant speed all the way through to the, to the end of his uh, race. But the hare had a variable speed. He was heading in the right direction, but he took that nap and he lost the prize. And I talk about that in the textbook, chapter one. So here's what we need. I mean, if you think about it, positions and distances and meters. I mean, if we're talking about human scale stuff, you know, like walking from here to Cadoba or here to Chick-fil-A, times and elapsed times in seconds, directions of motion, you know, where are you headed? You know, so on a curved path, that's going to be a lot of directions. Segmented path, it's only going to be in this segmented path, only a few directions. And then speed at each time. You've got to have that. Because it might be the tortoise or it might be the hare. Or it might be some other variation of speed. And these last two, three and four, that's actually, you could, you could say that all in one statement. You need to have the velocity at each instant of time. So those are the things that we need to describe and then hopefully see patterns. And once we see a pattern, we can make statements about the pattern, statement being um, an equation of motion or some other equation. Now let's get to this next equation. So here's part four of our notes about speed and direction and velocity. Speed is a quotient. Miles per hour. Miles, distance, per, hour. Hour and time in the denominator. Delta x, let's get this um, nomenclature down. The symbol delta x, that's Greek letter delta, capital delta. Capital D for delta. D for difference. Difference meaning subtraction. So delta x means the difference or the subtraction of your two x coordinates. So x2 minus x1, or xa minus xb, or xf minus xi. xf meaning x final, xi minus meaning x initial. Initial position and final position. And hey, you guys, in delta notation, it's always later minus earlier. Let me repeat that. 
in delta x or delta t, which we'll do in a second, it's always later quantity minus the earlier quantity. All right, and that's by convention. It's just what we, you know, are customary. And it, it may, if it's in two dimensions, you may have, you know, a hypotenuse to, to work out. Then you've got a delta x and a delta y, and then a hypotenuse. But you could do it. We just did that just a few minutes ago. Now, the denominator is the elapsed time, and the symbol for that is delta t. And that's the difference in the two clock readings. Now, one of our clock readings was 122 something, and the other one was 122 something else. Hey, how many elapsed seconds were there? T subscript B minus T subscript A. How many seconds? Look at your notes. How many seconds? What? 39. Anybody verify that? 39 seconds. Yeah. Okay. So, so we figured out the hypotenuse, 36.9, and the time was 36, 39 seconds. So we can figure out the speed. All right, let's do that. All right, here's my V equals delta X over delta T. All right, there's my numbers. Delta X in the numerator, delta T in the denominator. So that's looking good. And so I'm going to have meters per second for a speed. And if you calculate it out, it's 0 0.946. And the unit of measurement is meter per second. Now, hey, you guys, just as a, a rule of thumb, just so you know, one meter per second is approximately 2.24 miles per hour. And so if you, so this was going to be 2 point something miles per hour. So it's pretty slow. Let me repeat that. One meter per second is the same as about 2.24 miles per hour. So anytime you have a, a speed in meters per second, multiply it in your head by two, and that's about half, and then a little bit more, 2.2, 2.24, and that's how fast it would be on a regular speedometer. Now, I want to talk about average speed and distance. And this is also in chapter one. Okay. If you take that equation, V equals delta X over delta T, and then you cross multiply, get that delta T over to the other side with, with the speed, V, um, you have a formula for the total distance. There it is. Delta X, the total distance traveled, is V delta T. And you can use this in two dimensions. If you have some delta y, you can handle that as well. And so now that's the total distance formula. And we're going to be talking about that on Monday. And we're actually going to do a little bit of calculus, visual calculus. <laughs> we're not going to do calculus equations Monday. But before we get to that, we have homework one. Homework one will include a few questions about this figure. And it will be activated by supper time tonight, due on Tuesday. You're dismissed. I'll see you on Tuesday, 1.20, right on time. Come on up. No, you got to get out of here. Uh, look it up on YouTube. It'll be up in just an hour, maybe less.